I'll be showing you how to make a third-person shooter controller using Cinemachine and the new input system in Unity. So you can see we can move around and when we look in another direction, our character will rotate to that direction and we can shoot and the bullet will move towards that position in the center of the screen. And then when we zoom in, you can see that our reticle has changed and we can get a more accurate aiming with less movement. And of course you can adjust these settings so it sways less. And in the next video, I'll be going over adding animations to this character from Mixamo, which if you don't know, they have all these free animations and characters that we can use and we'll be applying them to this game. And I'll also be going over the animation rigging package so that if we look up, for example, the upper body will look up so the gun will aim upwards and it'll be more accurate. All right, so let's get started. So once you have your project loaded, the first two things that we're going to need are the packages, so the input system and Cinemachine. So go to Window, Package Manager, then go to up here, Packages, Unity Registry, and scroll down until you find Cinemachine, and let's install that. And let's also download this Cinemachine example scenes because they have a third person sample and we're gonna be using that to make ours so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And lastly, we need the input system, of course. So just click install here. This is the 1.0.2 version. If you want, you can go to advanced, advanced project settings, and you can enable preview packages here. I understand. And when you open it up, it'll show you all the preview packages if you want to download the more recent versions. So I'm just going to download the newest one. And here, just click yes to restart the editor. All right, now that you got that set up, let's just make a simple floor here, 3D object cube. And I'm just going to increase the size here to 100 on the X and 100 on the Z. So we have our floor. And I'm also going to right click and create a 3D object capsule. And this is going to be our player. And you can just bring the player down to the floor. And quickly, I'm going to go into the assets and create a new folder for our materials, just so we can assign the floor and the player an interesting material. So you can right click and create a new material. Let's just call it floor. And I'm just going to paint it kind of grayish for now. Let's assign it there. And we can do the same thing for our player. Right click, create material. And I'm just going to name it player and assign it a red color so we can easily distinguish it. And you can just click it and drag it onto your player as we did for the floor. Another thing I want to do is add in another 3D game object in front of the player just so I can see what its forward direction is. So you can see our player's forward direction is the blue arrow. And I'm just going to make this small cube right here just so I can see kind of like some VR glasses. And I'm just going to assign the floor material to it, because why not? And I'm just going to call that face. So I just clicked it, F2 and face. And so that's our basic player for now. Now let's add in some movement. So in your assets folder, right click and create another folder. And let's call that scripts. And when you're inside, right click and create a new input action. And let's call it player controls. Action maps are a set of controls, a grouping of controls. So let's just create an action map for our player. For example, you can have player ground and then you can have another one for player swimming if, if you have different controls for each situation. And our actions are the actual controls. So there's a couple actions we want to make. We want to make a move, a jump, a look, an aim, and a shoot action. So you can click the first one, press F2, rename it to move. Then for the action type, select value, control type, vector 2. Since this is going to be with our WASD keys or arrow keys, and we're going to be moving in two dimensions, the X and the Z axis. And for our binding, we can actually just right click and cut this one. And instead, let's add up here a up, down, left and right composite. And let's call this WASD if you're going to use the WASD keys. And so now we have a 2D composite up, down, left and right. And then we'll assign our keys to correspond with what we want to be up, down, left or right. So for our up, we want that to be W. So click on this path here, click listen, and then click W on your keyboard. And now you've selected W. And let's do the same with the other ones. Path, listen, S. That's going to be our down. In our case, up is going to be going forwards. Down is going to be going backwards. Left, path, listen, A. And right, path, listen, 
D. So we're going to be using the WASD keys and it's going to return a vector 2. Up and down is going to be our Y. So if we're going forwards, we're pressing W, it's going to return 1. If we're going backwards and we're pressing S, it's going to return negative 1 on the Y. And vice versa for left and right. This will return 1 if we're moving right on the X for that vector 2. And if we're moving left, it will return negative 1 on the X for the vector 2. All right, now that we have that done, let's make a similar one for look. So our look is also going to be a vector 2 value control type vector 2. And that's because we're going to be moving our mouse around and it moves on the X and the Y axis. So for this one, luckily they have a path already we can use. Go to mouse and just select delta. Delta is the change in position between our current frame and the previous frame. And so it's used to get the direction in which we're moving in because the difference between the current position and the previous position gives us the direction. And that's our delta. And we'll be using that for our Cinemachine look. Next, we'll need our jump action. And we can leave that as a button. For the no binding, just click listen and spacebar. And of course, you can customize these to your liking. The other action we need is aiming. So aiming is going to be our right clicking on the mouse. So that's a button. Go to path, mouse, and then let's select right button, mouse. And finally, let's do a shoot action. It's going to be a button as well. And for our path, let's just click the left button on the mouse. All right, now that you have all of your actions set up, click Save Asset and then exit out of that. Now let's make a player controller. So for this, I'm actually going to be using the player input component for the new input system. So on your player, you can just add a component here, player input. And so this is Unity's way of making it easy for you to access the values in your input action asset. And the reason I'm using this is because usually I do this, generate c -sharp class. But unfortunately, if you want to rebind your keys, if you want to let the player rebind their keys in game, this isn't really supported if you do it this way, because this generates a new script. And if you're playing the game, you can't really alter the generated script. So they actually recommend to use the player input component, which can change these values dynamically during the game. So we can just drag in our input action asset here and it selects our default map as player. And we can just assign our camera here for our current player. And now that we have this player input component, let's actually create a new C -sharp script called player controller. And this will control the movement of the player. All right, and so you know how I like to take shortcuts. So in Google, just search up character controller Click on the first link. If you don't see it, just search Unity Character Controller. And we can go down to the Move Public Method. And so they have a script that we will just be copying, because why not? And let's just replace our script there. We can remove these two using statements since we won't be using them. And let's just replace this class name with Player Controller. So what this does is it uses Unity's Character Controller component to move the character. So in our update function, which runs every frame, you'll see that it's doing a grounded check. Is the controller grounded? If it's grounded and the velocity on the Y direction is less than zero, then let's just set it to zero since we're on the ground anyways. Then here it's getting the input with the old input system, which we want to replace. And then it's moving the controller based on that and the speed. This rotates the character depending on their movement. And this is the jump code. So if it's jumping and it's grounded, apply a velocity using the physics equation and then move the controller with added gravity. So let's change this to use the new input system. So first we want to scroll up and do using unity engine dot input system. Then here we want to add in a require component. And this is to make sure that when we add this script to a game object, it'll add these components in for us if it doesn't have it already. So only put this if you need to have the component added. So require component type of character controller. So we need a character controller and let's add one type of player input. All right, and then one thing I like to do is these values, we can move these upwards. And if we want to change these in the inspector, let's just add a serialize field here so we can change them while in play mode and test out some values. Then we want to actually access our controls from the player input component. And there's a way to do that. So first we need a reference to our player input component. So private player input, player input. Then in the start, do player input equals get component player input. 
And then actually here in the controller, since this component's already gonna be added with this require component, let's just do get component character controller instead. All right, and so the way you can access the controls is as so, so player input dot actions. So these are our set of controls and then we can index into it with a string. So let's say we want our move action so this will return our move action. And if we wanted to, we could read its value and it's a vector two. And this would return the current move value. However, since I don't really wanna be using the string all the time, cause I might make a mistake. I might misspell it like that. We only wanna do it one time. So let's actually cache this value. So up here, let's do a private input action, move action. And let's just duplicate that a couple times. One, two, three. Let's do look action. We also have a jump action. And actually let's just start with those three for now. So let's take the move action and equal it to our player input actions move. Now let's copy that two more times. Look action here and let's put look here. And finally, let's replace this one with jump and jump action. All right, so here in the movement, let's do vector two input equals move action dot read value vector two. So now we have our input with the new input system. And let's just replace this move vector with the new input systems. So input dot x and input dot y. And let's actually remove this rotation code because we won't be using it. And for the jump, here we can do jump action dot triggered. So this will return true on the frame that this jump was pressed. And I actually made a small mistake. We don't need this look action. So we can just remove that for now. All right, so we've replaced it with the new input system. So let's minimize that and add it to our player. So in the player here, let's add in a component player controller script. And you'll see that it automatically added our character controller for us, which is really nice. And it has these values here. One thing we wanna change is the min move distance to zero. If you don't change it to that, it'll have some problems jumping. That basically means that if the character moves less than that distance, it will not move at all. So if you're just kind of standing still and trying to jump, it might not jump at times. So just make sure to set that to zero. All right, so if we click play, You'll see that now we can move around when we press the WSD keys and when we press spacebar, it will jump. However, you see that the camera is not following the player and there's also no sort of character rotation whatsoever. So now let's actually do the interesting part, which is adding the third person camera perspective to the player. So for that, let's go to our assets folder. Then we're going to go to samples, Cinemachine 2.6.4 or whatever number. Cinemachine, scenes, third person, and third person with aim mode. So here's their sample package for third person controller. And if we just click play and see what it's like, you see that there is an error because we're trying to use the old input system class for movement in this sample because they don't implement the new input system in their samples for some reason. So just for now, to show you what it's like, I'm just gonna go to edit project settings, then I'm gonna go to player, and I'm just gonna change the active input handling to both. Although I do not recommend this, do not do this. I just want to show you what the sample is like. All right, and now if we click play on the sample, you'll see that we have this nice third person controller here. It's a little fast, unfortunately, but you see that it can kind of move around. For some reason, it's vibrating. Don't ask me why. And if we press control, it kind of zooms in the camera. But what we want is basically to copy this controller virtual camera that they've already made since they've done all the work for us. So in your assets, right click and create a new folder called prefabs, double click that folder and let's drag in their normal third person cinema machine camera along with their aim camera. So you can see that it won't let us add this game object to our prefabs for some reason, it always happens. So what I do is just click the normal one, control D to duplicate it, go to the aim, right click on the Cinemachine virtual camera, copy component, go to the normal one, right click, paste component values, 
So it just pastes literally all the values that we need. And now let's just drag it there. And let's just select original prefab here. Let's rename that F2 aim cinemachine and the other one to third person cinemachine. All right, so now that we have those nice values, let's go back to our scene under the scenes folder. All right, so then open up your prefabs and drag in the third person cinemachine camera. So what cinemachine does, it basically is a virtual camera and it has a set of defined behaviors that controls the main camera. And so in the main camera, we'll have to add in a cinemachine brain component because it's kind of like Cinemachine is injecting its behavior or its brain into the main camera. And you'll see that there's some settings here that will be changing soon, such as the default blend, which is how it switches between cameras. So make sure your main camera has this. Back to our Cinemachine virtual camera, which is the one defining the set of behaviors. We first want to assign a follow and look at property. So this is what the camera is going to be following. So obviously we want to make it follow our player. So drag your player into the follow property here. And I'm just going to put the game to the side so I can kind of see how it's looking. And then we'll also want it to look at the player. So drag in the player to the look at component. And so you might be wondering if you're familiar with Cinemachine, why we're using this virtual camera instead of the free look camera, which I've used in previous videos. And it's because this camera felt more snappy and with shooters, with third person shooters, you want your camera to feel more snappy and quick. If you have the Cinemachine free look camera, you'll see that there's three rigs around the player and the camera kind of moves along those three rigs. And it can be kind of hard to get right at times, the correct angles, and it kind of looks weird. So let's not do that. So instead we're going with the virtual camera, which is the main one. And there's two main aspects. There's the body and the aim. So the body is how the camera moves and the aim is how the camera looks. So the follow is the movement and the look at is the aiming. In this case, it's aiming towards the player. So there's a couple options here and we're going with framing transposer because there's not a lot of settings that we can use here. While the framing transposer has a lot more settings that we can use, like more damping, the screen X, the screen Y, dead zone, soft zone. And we don't want to do an orbit. We don't want to do a hard lock, which kind of limits its movement. And the track dolly is more for a kind of cinematic experience. Then there's a transposer, which is kind of the same thing except you'll see that it has a lot of less options that we can use. The framing transposer has a lot more options and settings. All right, and then for the aiming, we're gonna be using point of view POV. So it's kind of as if we're in the point of view of the player. And if you like, here's a list of the aim properties and what each one does. So the POV rotates the virtual camera based on the user input, which obviously we want to happen. The composer and group composer keeps the targets in the frame. This one sets the camera's rotation to the same rotation of the follow target. And the hard look at keeps the target at the center of the screen at all times. But we wanna be more liberal in our movement with the camera. So select POV for this one. Another thing I wanna mention is that it also has some nice noise here, which adds a sway to the camera. So for example, if we just click play right now, you'll see that it's freaking horrible. So I'm just gonna disable the Cinemachine Collider for now because it kind of freaks out. But you see that if we're just staring, the camera kind of sways with the wind which is nice. A lot of games do this to make you feel like you're more in the environment. And you can see we can look around the player, but our player is kind of down there. So we're gonna have to adjust our settings a bit. So I'm gonna go over the settings that I found the most useful. So look ahead is Cinemachine kind of predicting based on the player movement where the camera should be moving and looking ahead to that area. This is the offset from the object. Damping kind of softens the movement of the camera so it's more smooth instead of it just being quick. Screen X and screen Y we'll want to change this. So I'm just going to make the screen X a little lower and it basically moves the camera with an offset. And I found 0.25 to be a pretty good value. Then for the screen Y, I'm going to also decrease that to maybe 0.17. So the character is kind of on this side of the screen. You can also put the player on this side on the right one. Camera distance is how far the camera is from the player. So I want it to be a little further out and dead zone is basically where you don't want the camera to go. So you can actually click game window guides. So let's actually change our aim a little bit here. So this uses the old input system, mouse Y and mouse X. So let's actually replace it with the new input system. 
So add a input provider component, Cinemachine input provider, and this basically overrides the mouse X and mouse Y. So you'll see that they disappeared from the aim section. And now for the X, Y axis, let's just click this button here and select our player look input action. And so this is our delta mouse movement in the X and Y axis, and it will replace these values. And so one thing I want to mention here is in the speed here, I found 0 0.03 to be good. And in the horizontal one, I found 0 0.08 to be good. And so this one uses input value gain, which basically aims the camera depending on how fast your mouse is moving. So it's entirely dependent on how fast your mouse is moving or your delta instead of using this, which kind of smooth moves out the movement more with the delta values and more damping. And so you can actually change how the player looks by changing the vertical axis values. So you can see that if we move it down, it'll aim it more downwards and we can move our horizontal axis so it looks more towards the center of the screen. All right, so now if we click play, we can actually look up, look down, and we can look around the player. Pretty cool. And you'll see that there's actually some sway, but it seems a little too much. So let's scroll down to the noise and you can probably decrease this a little bit, maybe 0.7 instead. So it doesn't look around so much. All right. And so you see, even if we move our camera, the player does not rotate in the direction we're moving in. So let's quickly change that. Go to your player controller script. And here we'll want to take into account the camera direction. So what direction the camera is looking at so that we can move in that direction. And for that, we'll need a reference to our camera transform. So private transform, camera transform in the start. Then we can do camera transform equals camera dot main dot transform. So we don't want to be calling camera main all the time for no reason. So we want to do two things. First, we want the player to move in relation to the camera. So when the player presses W, we want the player to move forwards and that forwards is going to be in the direction of our camera. So if we're looking to the left, and we press forwards, then we want our player to start moving to the left, similar to how first person controllers do it. So to do that, we have to take into account the camera transform in our move vector here. And to do that, we can do move equals move dot X times camera transform dot right. And let's just do a normalized vector which returns the vector with a magnitude of one. So we can just get the direction. We don't really care about the value. And then we're also going to add in move.z times camera transform dot forward dot normalized. So what this is doing is basically taking into account the camera direction when we're moving. So when we move to the right or the left, it'll take into account what direction the camera's right and left is, and it'll multiply it. And we're just adding in the same thing, but for the forwards. So when we move forwards, we press W or we move backwards, press S. Then we times it by the forward vector of the camera so that we move in relation to the camera. And here, just make sure to set move.y equals to zero. If not, it'll look kind of funky jumping all over the place. We only really care about the X and the Y. And if you times it in here, it might put in an extra Y value that we don't need. All right, so just to test that out, you'll see that once we start to look at that way, then we'll move forwards in that direction, even if our character is not rotating. And if we press A to move left, you can see that we are now moving left in relation to the camera. All right, now let's rotate our character depending on where we're aiming. So I'm just going to add a comment, rotate towards camera direction. So for that, we need the rotation of our camera. So let's get that. So float target angle camera transform dot Euler angles dot Y. So this returns the camera's current Y rotation in an easy to digest format. So Euler angles is a vector three. This is a quaternion. It converts it into a vector three and we're getting that Y because we want to rotate it around the Y axis because in the player, for example, if you change the rotation code, it rotates around that axis, which is the green one. So it rotates around it. So we have that angle. Now we need a new rotation for our player. So quaternion rotation equals and so now let's convert this to a quaternion. So quaternion.euler, we don't want anything for the X. Let's just type in our target angle here and then nothing for the Z. So really you can just actually copy this and paste it here if you wanted to. And all this is doing is creating a quaternion for our player to rotate in. And so now we can change the rotation 
transform.rotation equals, and instead of just setting it directly, you can do kind of a lerp. So quaternion.lerp, you can also do slurp, which is spherically interpolate, while this is linearly interpolate, which makes it more smooth. So to lerp, we have to put our beginning from the current rotation. We're going towards the target rotation, and then let's do it at a speed, rotation speed times time dot delta time. Now let's set our rotation speed up here, serialize field, private float, rotation speed, and I'm just gonna set it to 0.8F. All right, just save that. And now if we click play, we can see that once we look around, the player starts to move in the direction that we're aiming at. Although it does it a little slowly, so maybe we can put it to two and it'll be a little faster. Five, I like five better. All right, so I'm actually gonna set the default value here and the rotation speed to five, and I'm just gonna set it there as well. All right, so now that we have the main third person cinema machine done, let's click that one, press Control D, and just rename it to Aim Cinema Machine. So F2 to rename. And for this one, we want it to be a little more zoomed in as if we're aiming the character. So I'm just gonna deselect third person cinema machine, and I'm gonna go to the Aim one. First thing we want to do is set the priority to 9 or just less than the third person Sin Machine one because the main virtual camera that is shown depends on the priority of the camera. So we don't want this one to be shown at the start. And so we just want to kind of adjust this to zoom more into the player so we can adjust the camera distance so it's closer to the player. And we can also adjust the screen X and the screen Y depending on what you want. And so just to click play, we're in the aiming one. And if we activate this one, for example, you'll see that it zooms out to that one. So I'm just gonna make both of them active again. And let's actually make a script. So go to your scripts folder to switch between the two cameras, which I've made a video on if you're interested. So let's create a C-sharp script here and I'm gonna call it switch vcam. And we are gonna wanna switch whenever we press our aiming key down. So we want to be using unity engine dot input system and serialize field private player input player input so we can get our actions make it lowercase here. I'm just gonna delete these functions for now and I'm gonna be caching our aim action so private input action aim action. Then in the await function, let's just do aim action equals player input dot actions and type in aim. And so we only really need to attach this to one camera and just change the priority of that one camera. So here we can actually import using Cinemachine and here we can do private Cinemachine virtual camera. I'm gonna call it vcam or virtual camera. In the awake function, let's also get a reference to that. So get component virtual camera, Cinemachine virtual camera. And then basically when we press our aim button, we want to switch these two cameras. So let's subscribe to our performed event for the input action. So let's do on enable. When the script is enabled, let's do aim action dot performed. So this is executed whenever our action is performed or in our case, the button is pressed. Then let's use this syntax plus equals, which is subscribing to the event. However, since I don't really want the parameters that come with it, I'll put this underscore here and let's pipe that value to our start aim function, which we have yet to make. And let's do the same for canceled, aim action dot canceled. So when we stop pressing the button, let's pipe that to cancel aim. And so here let's do an on disable function. Let's copy that here. And here we're just gonna unsubscribe from these events with the minus. So plus subscribe, minus is unsubscribe. So let's do private void start aim. And let's do a private void cancel aim. So for the start aim, this depends on what game object we attach the script to. So let's assume that we are attaching it to the aiming camera. So let's do virtual camera dot priority plus equals, and we can just select a number to increase it by, but I'm just gonna do it up here. Serialize field, private int, priority boost amount. Let's just do 10. 
Let's copy that. So this will basically boost the priority of this virtual camera by 10. So if you have two cameras, one of them is 10, one of them is nine. The one that is 10, the higher priority will be shown. So if you add 10 to the one with nine, then it'll be 19 and it'll be a higher priority than 10 and it'll switch over to that camera. So let's just copy this. And instead of plus equals, let's do minus equals. So we want to remove that 10 that we added. So then in your AIM Cinemachine camera, add your Switch VCAM script and make sure to drag in your player to get that player input component. All right, so now when we click play and we AIM, you'll see that the camera now zooms in and now it zooms out. Nice. However, it does so kind of slowly and we don't want that. So we can change that in our main camera. In the Cinemachine brain, as I mentioned previously, in the default blend, which is how it blends between the different cameras, I found linear to be a pretty good one. It just linearly goes from one camera to the other and I put it at 0.3 seconds, so it's a rather fast transition because this is a shooter game and we want this to be fast. So now it's faster. Another thing is in the aim cinemachine camera, you can actually decrease these noise values since when you're aiming, ideally you'd be focused more and it'll be less noise in your aim. So you can put this maybe to 0.3 on each or whatever you want. So before I add the reticles for the aim, I wanna mention the Cinemachine Collider, which came from the samples, but you can also add it here at extension, select Cinemachine Collider. And what this does is that when you get near a wall or some sort of collider in the scene, if the camera is clashing with the collider, it will try to avoid clipping through that game object. So for example, if we don't have it on, then you can see through the wall and the player is kind of obfuscated from the wall. But if we enable it, then it will detect the collision with the wall and try to avoid it. Make sure to have the follow and look at property to your player for this. So you can specify what you want to collide against and what you want to ignore. So if you select floor and control cube under the layer tab, you can add a new layer and add in whatever you want. I've already added an environment layer here. You just type it environment. Then when you select both of them, select the layer and click environment to put them under the environment layer. And now we can here under collide against, instead of default, we can put nothing and then select environment. So now it will only collide against the environment and not our player. You can also specify the minimum distance from the target. So if there's any object closer than 0.1 distance away from the player, it will be ignored. You can also change the camera radius, which I've set to 0.1. The default is one. And then the strategy is the important thing. So how do you want the camera to act once it has detected a collision? So do you want to preserve the distance that it has? Do you want to preserve the height? Or do you want to pull the camera towards the player whenever it, it's a collision? And so let's just keep it to preserve camera height. And then under ignore tag, let's actually give our player the player tag so under the player so under the tag here I've already given it the player tag but just click it here and give it the player tag and then in your Cinemachine Collider just make sure to ignore the player so that it works properly All right and now once I get close to the wall you'll see that it kind of glitches out and tries to maintain the height that it currently is at, which it looks kind of cool, actually. If we change to pull camera forward, you see that now it kind of zooms into the player, depending on where the wall is. So you can select which one you like the best. I think pull camera forward is nice, but preserve camera height is also nice. All right, so now let's add in the reticles for aiming. So let's right click and create a new folder and let's just call it sprites. We're gonna put in our reticle sprites there. So in Google, you can just search Kenny reticle or it's in the description and go to crosshair pack and let's click download. You can also support them if you'd like and you're free to use this in any project without permission. All right, so now once you've unzipped that folder, you can go to PNG and you can select what kind of color you want. There's a white retina. We have a bunch of cool ones here. I'm going to select this one and so you can kind of just drag and drop into your sprites folder here and that's going to be the one when I'm hip firing, not zoomed in. And when I'm zoomed in, I want a more accurate reticle. So I'll just select the 38 for the zoomed in one. So let's click one, control click the other one, select the texture type to sprite and then click apply. So now we can use it as a sprite and we can kind of just drag it onto our scene here. And now let's make a canvas for our UI. So right click and create UI canvas. And if you're gonna be using the advanced system, then just click replace with the input system module. But in my case, I just want to add in an image. So UI image, and let's just drag in our sprite here. Reticle, the hip fire reticle. And you can just select the canvas and duplicate that. 
call it third person canvas. And I can actually call the first one aim canvas. And this one I'm gonna call it aim reticle. And I'm gonna replace it with the other reticle, which I'm actually gonna decrease the size a little bit. 0 0.7, 0 0.7, so it's not as big. All right, and so I'm just gonna place these canvases underneath their respective cameras. So the aim canvas under the aim cinemachine and the third person canvas under the third person cinemachine. And then if we go back to our switch vcam script, here we're actually gonna change the reticles as well. So let's do a serialized field and let's do private canvas, third person canvas, and let's duplicate that, control copy, and I'm just gonna put here aim canvas. And we want the canvas so we can just enable and disable the canvas renderer directly. All right, and now once we have a reference to both of our canvases, then in the start aim one, we can do aim canvas dot enabled equals true and third person canvas dot enabled equals false. And when we cancel it, we want to do aim canvas dot enabled equals false and third person dot enabled equals true. So we're just switching which canvas is enabled and disabled here. So make sure all of your game objects are active. You can set the aim canvas to off, which it seems I actually switched the reticles here. So I'm just gonna switch their positions. All right, and now before we press play, we want to assign the canvases that we just made. So in your switch vcam script, assign the third person canvas here and the aim canvas there respectively. So when you press play, now you'll see we have our reticle here. And when we zoom in, it will change the reticle. Nice. Also, just want to mention, since we added the Cinemachine Collider for this Cinemachine object, let's just copy here. So right click, copy. And then the aim one, let's add in a Cinemachine Collider, same as the other one. And just right click and paste component values. And make sure that your aim cinemachine has your player follow and player look at component or else the collider won't really work as well. So now you see we can look around when we aim, it switches the reticle. Awesome. All right. And now since we have player movement, the cinemachine, third person, the aiming, the reticle, the noise, the cinemachine collider, now we can actually shoot the bullet, which is the whole shooter part. So in our player, let's create a new 3D object cube to act as our gun. F2, rename it gun. I'm just gonna move it to this side here. I also just realized that I actually changed my layout because I was trying to fix a bug while I was making this video. So if you're interested in this layout, it's actually up here. You can select whatever layout you want. I usually use tall because it's just much easier to see the difference between the scene and the game and it feels less cluttered to me. So sorry if that kind of tipped you off. I just realized that I had it changed. But yeah, just put your little gun next to the player, you know, adjust the size as necessary. I think that looks pretty good. All right, and now under assets materials, I'm gonna make a new material, right click, create material. I'm gonna call it the gun material. Let's assign it to our gun and we can do it like some cool color blue. That's a good color. And I'm actually gonna make a new material for the obstacles, just so I can kind of differentiate the wall a little bit. Green doesn't seem like a bad color. It kind of does, but. All right, so now once you have your gun, we'll also want to add under it, create, right click, create empty and let's say barrel. So this is where the tip of our gun is gonna be and that's where we're gonna wanna shoot out our bullet from. So let's move that barrel transform all the way to the tip of the gun a little bit forwards so that it spawns a little bit forwards from this gun. All right, and then in your player controller, let's add in the input action for shooting. Shoot action, shoot action equals player input dot actions and we can do shoot. All right, and so we want something to happen when we shoot. So same as the other one on enable and on disable and start actually goes after on enable. So let's change this to awake because awake happens before on enable and then after this goes start. All right, and so let's subscribe to our event as we did previously, plus equals. Let's do shoot gun, not shoot fun. And same here, instead of plus equals, do minus equals. All right, and now we actually have to create that function. So private void shoot gun. So we're gonna be using a raycast to do this. So I don't know if you noticed, but 
We want to shoot out our bullet from the pivot from this barrel right forwards. However, we want it to land where our reticle is. And usually the reticle is always at the center of the screen and it never changes for most games. So how do we actually get our gun to point to the middle of the reticle and have it shoot there. Well, we can kind of cheat. And instead of doing all the calculations with the gun, we can actually just use the camera. So we get the forward of the camera, which is this blue arrow. And that leads directly to the reticle because the reticle is at the center of the screen. And this axis, the Z axis, points directly to the center of the screen. So we use this to calculate where we want our bullet to hit. And then we shoot our bullet from our gun and make it hit in that location and that'll make it look as if the player actually aimed and it hit the correct spot that they're aiming at. So to do that, we'll need to shoot a ray cast out of our camera through the center of the screen until it hits something. And that's basically what a ray cast is. Basically a ray, you shoot something from one point, it goes forwards until it hits something else. It's kind of a vector, um, but in this case we call it ray cast because it's shooting a ray forwards. It's casting the ray. So to do that, in Unity we can do ray cast hit hit and we'll be setting this variable shortly and then we can do if physics dot raycast and we have to pass in our starting position so camera transform dot position which is the center of the camera screen we want to shoot it forwards camera transform dot forward we want to do out hit so out means that this variable will be populated with whatever we hit it with Inside of this function, they set hit, and you have to specify out here for it to work. And then we can do mathf.infinity, which this is the distance, how far we want the raycast to follow, which I'm just going to put infinity for now. And then you can also select the layer mask, what you want it to hit. So if you want to avoid your player, you can set it to the environment tag, or you can set it to the enemy tag, or we can just leave it empty and see what happens. So when we hit something, we're going to instantiate a bullet and we're going to tell the bullet to go to that position. And when it reaches that position, it will destroy the bullet and it will spawn a decal. So for my decal, I'll just go to opengameart.org and you can search a bullet hole here and the first one. And voila, we have this nice bullet hole that we'll be using and we'll spawn that. So you can just download this and drag it into your sprites folder and make sure to make the texture type to sprite. So this is what we're going to be spawning when we hit the wall. All right, so if we hit something, then let's instantiate a bullet, which we actually need a reference to. So serialize field private game object bullet prefab, I'm going to call it. Then here we can do game object bullet equals game object dot instantiate. So we're making an instance of this game object. And I actually recommend making an object pool, which I have a video on, so you can reuse these objects instead of having to instantiate them each time. So we pass in what we want to instantiate, the prefab. Then we pass in where we want it to instantiate. So for that, we need a reference to the barrel. So up here, we can do serialize field, private transform, barrel transform. And we have to set those later. Here we can do barrel transform dot position. That's where we want it to instantiate position. Then the rotation, which we can just do quaternion dot identity, which is just like the default rotation. And then here we can specify a parent, which I will serialize parent private private transform bullet parent. And so this will basically place all of the bullets under this parent. So bullet parent, so that our hierarchy doesn't get really messy. All right, so now that we actually instantiate this bullet, we want to add behavior to the bullet to move it forwards. But instead of doing it in this player controller script, which that's not its job, let's actually make a new script in the assets folder and call it bullet controller. And this will be attached to each bullet prefab. So each bullet controller will need some things. So first, it'll need a reference to the decal that it's going to be spawning if it hits a collision. So private game object. Then it needs a speed. So private float speed. I found that 50 works pretty well. Then we need a time to destroy. So if this bullet is just going on forever, how long do we want to wait until we destroy the bullet? Because we just don't want to have it go on forever. And then two other things that we need are we need to know where the bullet is going. So the target position 
And we need to set this from the player controller. So let's do public vector three target. And we can do kind of a getter and the setter, which is a C sharp notation. And this automatically on the back end converts it to a normal getter and setter. So you don't have to write the full thing. So for example, if you have this getter and setter here, it will convert it to a get and a set property here, which is nice to have. You can also have it be a private get or a private set and a public get or a public set. And then we need to know if it actually hits something. So public bool hit get and set. And this is because we'll be programming slightly different behaviors if it's hitting something or if it's not hitting something. And you'll see soon. So right when this object is instantiated or enabled, so on enable, let's destroy it. I'm just kidding. Uh, game object, destroy the game object and you can pass in time to destroy. So it will destroy the game object after three seconds. Then in the update, let's move the bullet towards the position. So transform position equals vector three dot move towards. And we have to pass in our current position, transform position, then we have to pass in the target position and then we have to pass in the speed. So speed times time dot delta time. And so now here's where the hit will come into play. So here we can say if vector three dot distance, if the distance between the current position of the bullet and the target is less than some threshold, let's put 0.01. And we do that because it might not ever really reach the target exactly because this might interpolate it over to the target. And if we do just equals zero, it might not actually reach that value. So we wanna have like a small threshold if it gets near enough to our target. So if it gets near enough to our target, let's just destroy it. So now you're wondering, why don't we do this on the on collision enter? And we are gonna have this function on collision enter. When this bullet collides with something, we'll destroy it. So then what's the point of this? Well, let's say, what if you're shooting into the air? It's not gonna collide with anything, yet we wanna destroy it after it has reached our target, which will be setting a fake target so it looks as if it's going to the center of the reticle. So really we're just making the player believe that the bullet is going to the center of the reticle when in reality we're doing a little bit of math trickery to shoot it out from the gun so that it looks as if it's going to the center of where you're aiming. And here, since we only want this to happen when there's no target, so when it's being shot into the air, we can do a quick not hit. So if there's no target, and we're getting close to our distance, let's just destroy it, might as well. And I put this first because you always wanna put in an if statement the easiest things to calculate first, because if we do have a target, it'll just not continue to do this calculation. It'll just be like, oh, we hit this condition, so we can just go on to the next thing. But if you put this first, it has to do this math, and then it has to go on to the not hit, when in reality, we could have just checked this first and saved ourselves some calculation. So on the uncollision enter here, before we destroy it, let's instantiate our decal. So game object instantiate bullet decal. And here we want to instantiate it where this collision happened. So you can do other dot contacts at zero because this might have hit various things along the way. And this is everything that has been hit. So the contact points and look, it's telling me I should use get contact instead. I learned something new today. So get contact at zero. So get the first thing that it has contacted and let's get the point. And I'm just gonna cache this here, contact point equals other dot get contact at zero. Let's just name it contact so we don't have to keep writing this over and over again. So contact that point. So we're instantiating it at this point. Then we want to instantiate the rotation in relation to the normal of whatever it's hit. So for example, if it hits this wall, we want the decal to spawn facing this blue arrow. And in the on collision enter function, it returns to us the normal, which is whatever is perpendicular to our plane, which in this case is the blue arrow. And that's the direction where we want our decal to be facing outwards. So to do that, we can do quaternion dot look rotation, and then we can just do contact dot normal. So that just means that this object will now look towards wherever this normal is facing, which is exactly what we want. 
right, and another thing I just want to add is that here, if we spawn it directly where it hits, Unity is not going to know how to render it because now it has two objects in the same location and it doesn't really know what to render first. And so you'll have kind of this glitchiness appearing if you don't actually move this point a little bit more forwards than what it hit. And so I'll actually explain this a little bit more after we spawn this object so you can see what I'm talking about. So back to our shoot gun script. Now for our bullet, we can do bullet controller, bullet controller equals bullet dot get component, bullet controller. And this is assuming that each bullet will always have a bullet controller. I actually recommend maybe using an interface and doing if it has this bullet interface, then do this. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to right here assume that each bullet has a bullet controller. Now we can do bullet controller dot target equals hit dot point. So this is what we set previously. And let's do bullet controller dot hit equals true. So it has hit our target and vice versa. If we have not hit anything, then we still have to spawn this game object, which if you'd like, you can actually do this up here to save you some duplication, some code duplication. And instead of the bullet target being our hit point, since we haven't hit anything, we can kind of just use the camera transform forward and select a random point along that vector. So in our camera, the forward, we just want to select a random point along this vector. Let's say we want it here and we're going to use this vector to determine how far it should shoot, which is pretty easy to do. So all you have to do is take into account the origin. So camera transform dot position. So this is where we will be starting. Then we're adding in the forward direction camera transform dot forward. And this is kind of like the slope formula MX plus B. B is our starting position and MX is our slope. And then you can just times it by some value here, which we can set up here. Serialize field, private float, bullet hit miss distance. Not a great name. I'm just going to set it to 25 and we can just times it by 25 here. All right. So now let's go back to our script here in the player controller in the player game object, drag the barrel into the barrel transform. Then let's make a new empty game object, call it bullet parent. Then under the player, drag in the bullet parent into the bullet parent. Then we'll need a bullet prefab. So let's just make a 3d object sphere call it bullet. Let's zoom in. It's way too big. 0 0.1, 0 0.1 on the scale X and Y and Z. So it's smaller. And then we have to attach here, add component, bullet controller, and we have to attach our bullet decal, which go to assets, sprites, and let's just drag in our sprite here so it can spawn a decal, which is huge. Let's rename it to bullet decal. And let's very much decrease the scale to maybe 0.1. There we go. Let's just put the position to 0, 0, 0. Go to your prefabs folder, make it a prefab. Now you can delete it from the scene. Then in your bullet, assign the bullet decal, then make that bullet a prefab. Now delete that bullet from your scene, then go back to your player and assign the bullet prefab to the player controller. All right, and now you'll see that when we shoot, it stops there and it shoots directly into the center of the aim. Same when we aim it shoots into the center of the reticle. And when we shoot up, you'll see that it moves towards the center of the reticle. But for some reason, when we shoot in the air, it kind of just chills there for a bit instead of being deleted. And the decals are not spawning correctly. And the reason why the decals aren't spawning is because on collision enter needs one of the colliders to be a rigid body. So we can just take our cube and our floor and assign it a rigid body. And we can just freeze the position and rotation for both of them since we don't want them to be moving. And now if we, you know, shoot these decals with spawn and you'll see that they're kind of glitching out, which is because Unity doesn't know which one to render first. So to do that, we can kind of offset the decal a little bit more forward so it doesn't clash with the wall. So here in contact point, let's do it similarly as before with the MX plus B. So this is the B we're starting here and then we're adding in a direction or a slope, which is going to be contact dot normal times. And we can do a very small number point zero 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 one F. 
And this is just to offset it a little bit in the normal direction so it doesn't completely clash with the wall. So see, now it does not clash with the wall. You can also randomize these a little bit and you see that now it spawns upwards here. So why is this being frozen in midair? Let's take a look. It's because on the player controller, on the bullet controller hit, I accidentally set it to true here. So in the else you wanna set it to false because it hasn't actually hit anything. All right, so now when we click play and we kinda of shoot into the air, you'll see that it disappears and it's actually being deleted but you wouldn't be able to really tell. And one other thing I wanna mention is you'll see that while you play, your cursor is going all over the place. And so you can actually lock the cursor to the middle of the screen by doing cursor.lockState equals cursor lock mode dot lock. So this will lock the cursor to the center of the game window. So it just doesn't go everywhere. So now we maximize this on play. You see that now my cursor disappears and now it's at the center. And you'll see that it's kind of glitching out. And that's because it seems to be colliding with the gun or something on my player. So I have to make sure to put the tags on, on as the player. And so you see, we shoot and then when we aim, it kind of aims in and you can adjust these values as needed. And let's just fix right here, our gun and our barrel. Let's tag it as player. And you see that now everything works as expected. Of course, we can't really aim up or down, but that's gonna be in the next video or next videos applying animation to the character so that it looks more real and so that when you aim up, the gun aims up and that's gonna be with the animation rigging package. You can also increase the rotation speed so it's more accurate. Yeah, and so if your bullets do get stuck, you can also add in a layer mask to the ray cast if you wanted to right here. In the ray cast, you can add in a layer mask for whatever you want if you only wanted to hit the environment or enemies. So if you wanted to compare tags, you can do other.gameobject.compare tag. And if it's the player, then just ignore the player. But that's just an example if there seems to be some collision problems. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. There's a lot of different kinds of third person character controllers. This is just one way how to make them. You know, some of them make the reticle move around the screen. Some of them have orbit cameras. There's just a lot of different ways to do it. But I hope you enjoyed learning about this way. And in the next video, I'll walk over animations. And so this video actually, in a way, was sponsored by my patrons because we reached our goal. And that goal's reward was for me to make a video on whatever the patrons voted for. And they voted for a third person character controller shooter plus animations, which is actually going to end up being two videos in, or three instead of one because there's just so much to cover. And this video was already pretty long. So yeah, thank you so much for all of my patrons. Your support helps make videos like these possible. Thank you so much. And it also inspires me to continue making more videos. And with that, I'd like to thank my new patrons. In the supporter tier we have, thank you so much for your support. In the enthusiastic tier we have, Eric, Adam, Ben, Chris, Loam Media, Alexander, Weldon, Trung, Mameli, Drake, Christian, thank you so much for your support, really appreciate it. And in the dedicated tier we have Sophie. Thank you so much for your support and thank you to all of my patrons for all of your support. It really helps make these videos possible. And if you're interested, the link is in the description. I offer source code, early access, and an exclusive Discord channel. And if you haven't already, be sure to join our Discord channel where you can ask questions, chat, or post memes. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to like and subscribe as it took me a while. And I believe about 80% of people who watch my videos are not subscribed. So if you did enjoy it, please be sure to do so. And I'll see you next time.